everybody. Hello. We'll wait a couple seconds till everyone is in. Mm -hmm. Great. Welcome, everybody, to this TMC tasting for Sellers 293. My name is David Markovich. I'm the head of marketing at Opimian. As well, joining me is Kim Chan Hun, the marketing assistant. She's uh, running the board today. As well, our special guest is the master, our masters of wine at Opimian, Jackie Blisson. Hello, everybody. Hi, everybody. Just a couple of uh, rules here. And, uh, there are no rules, is number one. Number two, we any questions it's very interactive so please feel free to put any questions comments in the chat uh, i'm sure as you go through the tasting with jackie you will have a couple of maybe different tasting notes uh something on your nose or palate that's a little bit uh different great i mean everybody has has their own has their own uh, taste so it's perfect well please and as well we can also do some any ideas for food pairings any or any questions about geography or history about the wines itself Jackie's here to help. So we're going to take a tour of the Rhone. And this is uh, for seller 293, which is uh, coincidental because we're on seller 303, which is the Rhone Valley again. So very, very topical as two of the wines in the, in the TMC case are available in full cases in the 303 seller. With no, no further ado, here's Jackie with some tastings. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on your Saturday early to late afternoon, wherever you're based. Uh, as David said, this is absolutely your tasting. Please feel free to interrupt at any time with your questions. I'm always happy to field as many questions as you may have, comments even. And also, as David said, there is absolutely no right or wrong in wine tasting just because I mentioned something that I'm tasting or smelling in the wine and you're, you've got something different on your palate. We all have very different palates. And that's what makes wine so much fun is that we all like different things. We all gravitate towards different styles. So today, yes, we are in the Southern Rhone Valley. So this is in the southeast of France. We're south of Lyon, sort of on our way uh, down, well, south even of uh, Valence, which is uh, and not basically anywhere between Valence and the city, the Roman city of Nîmes. This is this area that we're talking about here. And this is a warm area. This is a Mediterranean climate, abundant sunshine, quite dry in terms of a climate. And they have a phenomenon called the Mistral wind that basically, the, as the Rhone Valley uh, follows the curving path of the Rhone River uh, with sort of embankments on either side, this wind, this powerful wind blowing down from the north gathers speed and whips through the vineyards and almost acts like a hairdryer, uh, keeping anytime there's any rain, and it doesn't rain that much in this area, uh, it dries it right away. So this is an area that has very low uh, fungal pressure. So vineyards can suffer quite a lot in rainier areas from humidity, from wet conditions. And if any of you are gardeners, you know that very wet, humid conditions, damp soils are the enemy of a healthy plant and can create a lot of conditions for things like mildew uh, or odium, other, other types of uh, you know bunch rot, things like that. And so this is a great area for organic and sustainable viticulture because you have this really warm, really dry area with this wind that's coming through and keeping everything even drier. Um, and so great conditions for winemaking, for grape growing all together in this Southern Rhone Valley. We're gonna be focusing on two areas today. Uh, the first is an appellation. So appellation is just the name for an origin, an area, a specific area of winemaking. The first appellation is called the Costiel de Nîmes, and that's going to be all around this ancient Roman city of Nîmes in the far, far south of the Rhone Valley, right where it sort of meets Provence and the Languedoc, not too far from the Mediterranean Sea. And then for our third wine, we are Domaine des Trois Lys, we will be in the Côte du Rhône, so a little bit further north, 
uh, north of Orange, north of Avignon, on the right bank of the Rhone River. So two slightly different terroirs, but an hour drive between the two areas. So I think that we're going to go, if you're wanting to open your wines now, or at least some of them, we'll probably start here with this one, Chateau saint Benizé, Costiel de Nîmes 2020. Then the second Costiel de Nîmes we'll go for will be the Vignoble Bellefontaine, this more modern, uh, silvery, quite elegant label here. And then we'll finish with the Domaine de Troilis Côte de Rhone gold medal winner at the very prestigious Concours Agricole de Paris. I don't know if you can see this, we've got quite a lot of light on here. That's going to be our third wine of the day. So three different uh, domains, three different estates, but what they all have in common is the same owners. Yann Soulerac and Elise Boss Platière are the owners of these three estates. And they really were interested in expressing different terroirs, different areas through these different chateaus, instead of just having one estate and pooling, uh, you know, vineyards all together under one label under one name, they really kept the identity of these historic chateaus and domains because they found that each had quite different mix of soils, of uh, vineyard exposition, whether the vines are facing south, southeast, southwest, that can make a difference in terms of how the grapes ripen. Um, in terms of specific elements of microclimate. So they really like the idea of making different wines from these three different terroirs. So starting with the Chateau Saint-Benizé, if anybody's got that open today, feel free to give it a pour, give it a sniff. So here, as I said, we're in the Costiel de Nîmes. Costiel de Nîmes, far, far southern Rhone, right where it meets Provence and the Languedoc. Um, this is an area where they make a lot of red wine, the, the wines of the Southern Rhone Valley are blends for the most part. Grenache is a major grape here, as is Syrah. Most of the wines tend to be blends of Grenache and Syrah. And then you've got uh, uh, secondary grapes that are thrown in to add a little bit of fruit, a bit of spice, a bit of structure, depending on the grape. And here, uh, the third grape added in is uh, Marcelon. So Marcelon is an interesting grape. You might not have heard of it before. It is actually a cross of two grape varieties, two Vitis vinifera grape varieties. One, two that you probably know, one is Cabernet Sauvignon and the other is Grenache. So we have Syrah and Grenache and then a third grape that has a Grenache element, but also has a Cabernet Sauvignon element in its crossing. And this grape Marcelon is interesting because you get all the lovely ripe fruit and voluptuous character of Grenache with just that uh, more uh, bold sort of structured sense you get from the Cabernet Sauvignon, deeper color. Uh, so the Marcelon is quite an interesting addition here, but this will be mainly Syrah and Grenache in the blend. And so, this is a wine that I find is just so easy drinking. I always find that the wines from the Southern Rhone Valley, if you're at a loss for what to serve for supper, you have people coming over that like red wine um, and you don't know, you've got different guests, you don't know what their palate is each. Rhone, Southern Rhone Valley is just easy crowd pleasing wines. They have enough body for those who like fuller bodied wines, but they're soft and round for people who don't love big, heavy tannins. Uh, they're quite balanced in terms of their acidity. They're not too acidic. They're not too tannic. They're not too ripe, but they're ripe enough. They're sort of that Goldilocks wine that I find really is just easy to, to easy crowd pleasing and very easy to pair with. Southern Rhone Valley wines uh, can go really well with a huge number of sort of everyday dishes, spaghetti bolognese, uh, tacos, um, pizza, things like that. They pair super well with all sorts of stuff like that. They pair well with vegetarian dishes because they're not too, 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 too bold. They won't overpower if you're doing, I don't know, baked aubergine or a, a mushroom type dish. But also if you're doing red meat, they can stand up to that as well. So super, super versatile. So I keep going off topic. Back to the Chateau Saint-Benizé, Sierra Grenache Marcelin blend. I find this wine really soft on the palate, but medium in body, quite ripe uh, and smooth. 
some nice dark fruit. I even get a little bit of black olive um, tapenade, you know, uh, when you crush black olives and you make that lovely spread that you can put on uh, on uh, little, what are those Italian, you know, those long Italian gr grassini things, those uh, fluked um, cracker type things. You can dip those in the black olive tapenade. I get a hint of that black olive and that's common for Syrah from the Southern Rhone Valley black olive notes. So I'm definitely getting those here. Has anybody else got this wine open? Anybody have any comments for what they like about it, don't like about it, find surprising? I find that you, you get a ripeness to the fruit, but it's not overpowering. It's not baked, it's not jammy, but you definitely get some nice ripeness and a lovely smooth plush character on the palate. So you might notice, for those of you who have this wine in front of you, that above the label, you've got this little sign here that says Terra Vitis. Oh, I'm seeing some comments coming in. Less fruity than I was expecting, giving the grapes. So this is a uh, less fruity. I, I find it quite fruity, but I find it's not the baked, jammy, sort of cooked fruit. I find the fruit maybe is potentially a bit more shy because it's it's just sort of ripe, freshly picked fruit rather than that more opulent sort of baked character to the fruit. But yeah, I can I can see your point. You Tasting through the three, you might find some of the other ones have more forward fruitiness to them. And then there was a percentage of each grape in the blend. I don't have the exact uh, percentage, Paul, but Syrah and Grenache would definitely be the major dominant grapes and the Marcelin will be sort of 15, you know, 10 to 15% of the, of the blend. I would say tasting it, it, to me, tastes like there'd be more, a little bit more Grenache. Typically, you you get uh, blends that are sort of 60% Grenache, sort of 40 to 50% Sierra, and then just a splash of the, of the Marcelin. So Catherine's finding this wine quite understated, quite shy. Maybe uh, leave, it, uh, leave it open for a little while uh, to see how it expresses itself. But it is on the softer side, absolutely, for sure. So no, Radian, this wine is not in the current offering. This wine is from your master's case, but in the current offering, it's the other two wines, the Belle Fontaine and the Domaine des Trois that are in the C303 coming up. Um, so I think that this wine, as I said, so on the softer side, medium in body, uh, bright fruit, but maybe a little bit understated for sure. Uh, I agree with Twyla. It just gives it an, a, quite a lovely approachable character, and it's just quaffing. It's just a quaffing wine. This is something that you can serve with your everyday dinners. Great for a piece of cheese, a little charcuterie. This is just an easy sipping wine, and it's the sort of wine you serve a teeny bit chilled, not cold, but just, you know, put it in the fridge for 10 minutes, 15 before serving, and I think that's going to make the fruit pop maybe a little bit more than it is right now. Um, and yeah, I was going to say, so you see this little sticker here, Terra Vitis. So that, and I'll put it a little closer so you can see because I've got lots of light on, as I said, this little sticker, Terra Vitis. So that is a sustainability um, certification in France. Uh, it's been around for a very long time. It was initially what they called reasoned agriculture, lutte raisonnée. And the idea was to, the initial idea behind this back in the sort of 80s and 90s was to reduce the amount of herbicides and pesticides that were being used and only use them when uh, it was absolutely necessary. It used to be that a lot of winemakers, a lot of grape growers would just have a spraying regiment. They would, every 10 days, they would pulverize their vineyards with all kinds of herbicides and pesticides and keep them looking perfect, impervious to any, you know, humid weather, any, any funguses, any insects that could attack them. Uh, but we realized that was very harmful for the planet, for the soil. And so Terra Vitis, their initial aim was just to have a more reasoned approach, to really carefully survey the vineyards, carefully survey the upcoming weather conditions, and only treat when uh, absolutely necessary. And it's kind of evolved over the years into more sustainable practices. Most people who are Terra Vitis will not use herbicides and pesticides anymore, and are really looking at the long-term health of the soils, of the vineyards, of the people working in the vines, because all of those chemical treatments had very uh, nefarious effects on their health as well. Um, and so it's evolved into a really robust um, sustainability program that is getting uh, more comprehensive by the, by the vintage.
Um, Tony asked me if I'm getting any secondary or tertiary aromas or flavor. So secondary aromas in wine come from the wine making. So if it was aged in oak, for example, you would get secondary aromas of sort of oak spice and vanilla and cedar and things like that. And then tertiary aromas are the aromas that come with age, with age in the bottle, age in cellar, things like leather or uh, mushroomy or wet leaf for just kind of older, you know, dried fruit, things like that. Those are all tertiary aromas. This is a 2020 vintage, so it won't have any tertiary aromas yet. And it was an it uh, was fermented without oak. It's an um, it's a uh, tank aged, very briefly aged wine. That's really the focus here is the fruit. So you won't get so many secondary and tertiary aromas here. It'll mostly just be the fruit. And I find those little hints of black olive on it that you're gonna be getting. Paul asks, was this area affected by frost in recent years? So we do sometimes, I mean, as climate change is starting to give more erratic weather conditions, more extremes, we have seen pockets of frost, but it's not common in the Southern Rhone Valley. This really is a very clement, moderate, I sort of warm, sunny area. So frost is quite rare in um, in the Southern Rhone, in the Costa del Anime. But they have, there have been been periods. I don't think in 2020 there was any. 2021, there was widespread uh, spread frost and cool periods that even affected this area. But I think in 2020, no, it was quite a warm vintage, as was 2019, the third wine we're tasting. So if there aren't any more questions to do with the first wine, I think I'll move on to wine number two. Is that cool, everybody? All right, yep. Vignoble Bellefontaine. So quite a different label, quite a different look here with these uh, squiggly, uh, these well, these rectangular silver wines, the Prestige Cuvée. Um, again, Coast Yellow but I think you'll find same vintage, same growing area, but I think you'll find the wine is quite different, same owners even. Um, it's not an exact same area of Costellini. This area where Bellefontaine is, a little bit um, further uh, southeast, I believe. Uh, so it's got a little bit more impact from Mediterranean breezes. Um, the soil here has some uh, of the rounded river pebbles. It's quite rockier soils. And the sort of rocky soils you might find in places like Chateau of Dupap, these uh, large, what they call galets roulés, these big sort of rounded pebbles that are brought, that are rounded by being in the, carried by the water for long periods where they turn and turn and turn and turn. And then they get deposited along their uh, called fluvial soils because they're carried down the stream by the river and then they're deposited in the vineyard. So quite a rocky area. And rocky soils can be interesting, especially when they're light in color, because they, uh, first of all, have great drainage so that the uh, roots of the vines will go deep down and not uh, be affected by too much damp around the roots, which is never good. Uh, and they, uh, that light color will reflect all of the light and heat back up into the vineyards. So it gives uh, quite a lot of ripening potential back up into the vine. I'm just pouring the second wine here. This is a blend of Syrah, Grenache, and I believe equal parts. This is an estate, so same owners, but this estate uh, is undergoing organic conversion. So what that means is you can't from one day to the next decide that you're going to be organic and stop using pesticides and uh, you know follow all the organic rules and get to slap organic on your label. It's a three-year process because the uh, vineyards and the soils take time to regenerate to, you know, basically for all of those chemicals to uh, to to be absorbed by and, and washed away from the vineyards. And so they are in that three year period where you have to follow all the rules, all the strictest set of rules possible for uh, organics, but you're not yet allowed to uh, label your wine as organic. So three-year organic conversion process. So quite a strong commitment being made here by uh, Belfort then. And this wine, the 2020 vintage, what we're tasting was Jane Masters. So she was the master of wine that tasted these wines for the cellar. This was her coup de coeur. This was one of her absolute favorites from cellar 293. And um, so uh, we're tasting it today. And it was one that really uh, 
was not only a favorite for the Master of Wine, but a favorite, I believe, for uh, purchase. For, so I think it's one of the members' favorites. David's nodding. So yes, I've got that right. Uh, this is a wine that is a real, definitely a real crowd pleaser. And it's interesting for those of you who opened both of them, tasting them back to back, I'd love to see what you think about the two different styles. Same vintage, same appellation, slightly different area within the appellation that has a bit more effect of those cooling breezes that has those lovely rocky soils. And I find the two wines quite different. I'll wait till you give it a nose and give it a taste before I comment. So Alana says that her group likes this wine better. I think they're, they're both quite different. I like the first wine, but I do also have a little, I'd have to agree with you that, uh, that this wine just has a real brightness to it, a real freshness to it. It kind of lifts the fruit. I get a lot of uh, dark fruit on the, on the nose, but I also get hints of violet, you know, sort of floral hints, little touches of dark chocolate that are really attractive. And almost a mix of red and dark fruit that gives it sort of a tangy flavor profile, almost sort of lip smacking, very velvety on the palate, but with that freshness that really lifts it nicely. David's nodding. He's liking this wine. Uh, and I just, yeah, I think that this is just a beautifully balanced, harmonious, easy drinking wine. Definitely recommend serving this just a couple degrees chilled. As I said, 10 minutes in the fridge just gives it that sort of brightness. Because if you serve a wine too warm, the alcohol will really show and the flavors get a bit dulled, but you don't want it to be too cold either words because that can also dull the flavors. You need to just, as I say, 10 minutes and uh, it'll just give it a nice lift to it. Catherine says she's got some chocolate cranberry bar. Yeah, I can definitely see how that would work. You pull out the tanginess of that tart red fruit and those little chocolatey notes that I definitely get on the wine. I think that's nice. Yeah, it is, it is lighter in body. Wines from the Costa de Nima are never massive. They're never, you know, as full bodied as a Northern Rhone or as a Chateauneuf du Pape or something like that. Uh, they're going to be slightly lighter, but I think that adds to their versatility in terms of what you can pair them with. You know, it's not, there aren't that many red wines. A lot of people prefer red wine and want to drink red wine all the time, even before their meal. If you're serving them a drink before dinner, they want red wine. And there aren't a lot of red wines I find that drink well with no food whatsoever. But I do find with these styles of wine, they just have uh, very approachable tannins, very, very uh, bright fruit. And these are the kind of wines that I think you can serve on its own or with a whole, as I said, a whole variety of dishes. So I think that lightness sort of plays in its favor. But if you like fuller bodied wines, the Rhone also, as I said, Chateauneuf du Pape, Gigondas, and when you go into the Northern Rhone, the Sierra wines of Hermitage or Cote Roti, you can get in some big wines there if that's more your, your thing. Does anybody else have any comments for the Vignoble Belle Fontaine? I just love the nose on this wine. I find it really perfumed, but not over the top. Again, you're not so much baked or jammy fruit, just really bright, fresh, uh, pretty, pretty fruit nose. All right, quieter on the Belle Fontaine. See how it, uh, it's always nice once you've opened these wines to taste them now and then, you know, put them, put them to the side for a little bit and then taste them again, taste them again with food, uh, pour them into your glass, leave it for a while, see how it tastes 15 minutes later. They evolve so much. It's one of the fun things about wine is it's a living, breathing entity and it's always evolving. And uh, sometimes you think you like one wine better. We did the tasting a couple of weeks back of, um, Malbec, uh, Argentinian Malbec. And I had my, I was with my brother and his wife right before the tasting and I had them try the three wines. We had, what was it, Kim Chen? We had a Malbec, a Syrah and a Cap uh, no, uh, and Cap so. Yeah, a Cap so, a Cap Franc and a Malbec. And we tasted all three and everybody, you know, definitely liked the Malbec better and we're just fans of the other wines. But then after the tasting, I had the bottles that had been open for an hour and I served a little aperitif and I mixed up the bottles and had them taste all the wines blind again. And they all picked completely different wines and they swore up and down before that they didn't like certain wines. And then afterwards they changed which ones they liked and didn't like. So it's really interesting to see how wine evolves as it opens and as you're, you know, what you're depending what you're eating with it. So 
definitely a fun game to play with people. So those are our two Costiel de Nîmes wines. And as I say, Costiel de Nîmes, you're really in the south, 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 south part of the Rhone Valley. You're right where in an area, a beautiful area called the Camargue. And the Camargue is, uh, oh, David's nodding. I think he must have been to the Camargue. A beautiful place, wild horses roaming. Uh, so there's, some, there's some sort of marshy, swampy areas. And then other areas got beautiful plains with wild uh, herbs growing. They call Garrigue. Uh, and you get that smell in some of the wines. It's really beautiful. Quite a, quite a beautiful part of France. And it's where this galley, where this Camargue area meets Provence and Languedoc. So you really, uh, for a long time, the Languedoc, the, the larger Languedoc wine region of France claimed Costiel de Nîmes as, as their area. And there was sort of a tug of war between the Rhone Valley and the Languedoc on where Costiel de Nîmes should sit. It is now firmly within the Rhone Valley, but it definitely is uh, sort of a mix between the two styles, between Languedoc wine and, and Southern Rhone Valley. So in a more traditional, firmly within the Southern Rhone Valley, a little further north, will be wine number three, the Domaine oh. des Trois Thank oh, you. Yes. I think we have some questions from Connie. Flamingos, David, you're totally right. I forgot to talk about the flamingos in the Camargue. That's a big feature. What did you? What were you going to say, uh, Kim Chen? Uh, Connie is asking, what food would you pair with this? Oh, yes, that's a great question. Um, again, I think this wine is super versatile. I, I think it's got a little bit more uh, tension and a little bit more body than the first wine. So I might go, you, you could go for heavier things here. Um, I think this would be a great wine for very, very, very mildly spiced dishes. You could probably do a very mild spice uh, like chili con carne with this type of wine. You could do this just with a, a grilled, you know, being very, very classic. You could do this with a, a grilled lamb, for example, or or a steak. Um, you could do this one would also work well with um, uh, what else would be great on this. Yeah, again, I think things like aubergine uh, type dishes would work well. But I would definitely go for the light, your more light foods with the first one, and then something that's got a more of a medium bodied uh, personality with the second wine. And as I think, I think it's very mild spices could work really well here for sure. Also, Jean, Jean Paul was asking, would either of these wines age? Not really. These are wines really to, to buy and drink. I'd say they would hold well for two or three years. Um, four years max, but I would say these are wines that you'll get the most enjoyment from drinking within their first 18 months, two years, because they're really wines that are vinified. So the winemaking style is really done in such a way that they're trying to maximize, really preserve the fruitiness and the freshness. Because a lot of those, we were talking before about secondary and tertiary aromas. So the what we have mainly here is primary aromas. And primary aromas come from the grape itself. They come from the grape skin, uh, for the most part, a little bit from the pulp, but mostly from the grape skin. And if you want to preserve those primary aromas, which are volatile, which means they can easily, these are aromatic compounds, can easily uh, disappear basically at warm temperatures. If you really want to preserve that freshness and fruitiness, you would uh, vinify, you would ferment in a, uh, at cooler temperatures and often in stainless steel or cement or a vessel that's quite inert so that there's not, there's no oxygen exchange, no, no aromatic compounds are being allowed to sort of vaporize into the air. Um, so this style of winemaking would be that, would be a slightly cooler temperature fermentation, would be in these stainless steel or these concrete tanks uh, where the idea really is to, to have a wine that is very fruity, floral, easy drinking, soft, smooth. Um, and so definitely within the first couple of years, they would show that best when drinking. So wine number three, cool. Domaine des Trois Lis Codon Truffe Noir, black truffle. I don't know if anybody's ever tasted black truffle is one of my absolutely favorite things in the world. I love that flavor. Um, so this wine I find is quite interesting and quite 
different than the other two, although it is the same two, uh, same major grape varieties. Here, there's a few more grapes. We've got Syrah and Grenache, which would be really the backbone of this wine. And then you've got some addition of Morvedre and Sanso. Morvedre and Sanso are two other Rhone uh, and Southern France grape varieties that are very common. Morvedre has a slightly um, meatier, uh, tannic uh, quality to it that's interesting. And Sanso has a lovely softness, a lovely floral, fruity quality to it. So each of these wines, you know, like seasonings when you're cooking, they each bring something that really adds to the, the harmony of the whole. Um, so this is a 2019 vintage as opposed to 2020. So one more year in the bottle, 2019, great vintage, very warm like 2020, but cooler evenings at the end of the season, which really slow down the ripening because when the evening is cool, the rate of photosynthesis will slow or stop, which really allows the grape to uh, maintain higher acid levels as the sugar ripens. And that gives you a lovely balance of freshness in the wine. So 2019 is one of those vintages that people talk about uh, as being great for aging. If you wanna lay wines down, 2019 is a great vintage. Although at the Cote de Rhone level, these are not necessarily aging wines. 2019s that you wanna age from the Southern Rhone Valley would be more your cru villages like Gigonas or Chateauneuf du Pape. As I said, we're the Northern Rhone. I was talking about Hermitage, Cote Rôti. Those are the ones you lay down. This is more for drinking, but again, a great vintage. This wine has a Médaille d'Or, I mentioned that before, a gold medal from the Concours Agricole de Paris, which is quite a prestigious French wine competition, which is a great nod of approval for the quality of this wine. Um, and I find that this wine has, so this is from an area uh, in the, still in the Southern Rhone Valley, but it's quite a bit further north than the Costiel d'Anime. And on the other bank of the Rhone River, we we're on the left bank. If you were looking north, we we're on the left bank with Costiel d'Anime vineyards. Here we're on the right bank. And we are north of Avignon, north of uh, another village called Orange, uh, and on a bit of a promontory, on a little bit of a, of a hillside here, there's actually a, a big fortress in the town of Rochegude. Uh, and this is an area where they've been making wine since the Roman times. It's always had a very good reputation for its wines. Um, and it has a Côte de Rhone village status. This wine is Côte de Rhone, so it's from Rochegude and from its surrounding area. So it has the Côte de Rhone appellation to it. So Rochegude is known for its uh, mixed red clay soils, uh, as well as some flinty areas. And this, uh, the, the, the clay gives quite a fruity, suave, uh, plump, sort of rounded wines, but the lighter flinty areas tend to give uh, slightly fresher, lighter wine. So the two sort of soils together uh, have a really nice interplay, giving you a sort of a lightness and a freshness to the wine, but with that bright present fruit. Um, so again, still very Mediterranean-based climate, very strong influences here of the Mistral wind. Um, so the vines tend to be planted on single stakes rather than on a trellis to really hold each vine firmly because the Mistral is just such a powerful wind. I lived in the Rhone Valley uh, for eight years. I was working for a, a winery in a town called Gigondas, which is not too far from Rochegude. And this Mistral wind would blow. They'd always talk about three, six, nine. So it would either blow for three days in a row, six days in a row, or nine days in a row. And it really was the case. And when it started blowing, I mean, your hair is just flying in the wind, uh, you have to be careful how you open your car doors because they would just fly open and hit things. It's it's quite a phenomenon when you're when you're there when you see it, and it really does influence the vineyards quite a lot. Uh, it also makes because it really dries everything up. The grapes in areas that are strongly affected by the mistral, the bunches and the individual grapes tend to be smaller, and when the grapes are smaller, you have less pulp and more skin, and it's in the skin of the grapes that you have the aromatic compounds, what, what, what gives the aromas and the flavors to the grapes, but also the coloring pigments and the uh, phenols. So uh, that's a 
fancy word for the tannin, the tannin elements. So you tend to have, when you have a really small berry, great berry, you tend to have wines that are slightly more structured. So this is a phenomenon in areas where the mistral is really strong, like here in Hochgud. Um, so tasting this wine, again, interesting to taste this wine as compared to the Costiel de Nîmes wines, which are further south um, and tend to be slightly rounder and softer. I have a nice mix of red and dark fruit here, which I find is really attractive. And almost like a nutty sort of marzipan type underlying note. On the palate, I got some spice elements, almost a, a hint of licorice. And I find you've got a brightness from that hint of red fruit in with the dark. But overall, I find the tannins are a little more present here. It's a slightly more structured style of red wine. Um, the winds could be like the Santa Ana winds in California, definitely, Richard. Yeah, it's that def same style, very strong, powerful wind that just whips through the vineyards. There's a great comparison. Um, does has anybody got the third wine and compared with the two Costiel de Nîmes? Ah, Kim Chen's doing it. What do you think? Have you tasted it? Be interesting to see what you think. Not necessarily what you like better, but just what you think about the different flavors and I can definitely feel that the uh, the Menetrolis has more tannin like you mm -hmm. it's it's sticking in your mouth like and but it has a nice acidity so now I'm gonna go back to this yeah yeah I definitely yeah I, I you definitely feel it it's a slightly yeah more structured or a slightly firmer wine so this is something that when you're talking about food pairings uh, that that tannic element always always pairs very well with um, with meat, uh, with uh, hard cheeses, things like that. Always are, are a nice foil for tannin. Slightly peppery dishes, not too much, because if you put too much pepper, it highlights tannin in, in an aggressive way. But a slight hint of pepper, uh, black pepper, is very nice with with uh, soft with slightly tannic wines. So if you had, let's say a steak with a pepper sauce or something like that, that could work really nicely here. Uh, or even pork tenderloin, you don't need something quite as powerful as steak necessarily. Pork tenderloin would be would be great with a wine like this as well. I don't know for the other members, but I prefer the the Bellefontaine, like the Vignoble Bellefontaine, the second wine that we taste as more as like a starter of the evening. Mm -hmm. But I would definitely, drink this one on its own but not the Domaine de Trois Lis. yeah however I definitely with dinner or food, uh, with food yeah we forget about that because then when we're doing these tastings often we're tasting the wines you know in the middle of the afternoon without food so we tend to gravitate to what towards the wines that are softer and smoother because they are more appealing without food and the wines that have a sort of a dryness from the tannins you think, oh, I don't like this wine as much. But when you're eating, they often work better uh, because that element of the tannins can um, bind with the proteins in meat and soften the meat and soften the wine and have a really wonderful interaction. So uh, yeah, it isn't always the wines that taste best on their own that work best with the food. It's always best to taste all three, you know, if you've got the three bottles open and you've got your food ready, then it's fun to sit down and pour a little bit of each and take a bite and take a sit and determine which one you we, we, you think works best. And it's often not the one you thought it was going to be. You can often get some surprises there. So does anybody have any questions about this third wine, the Domaine des Trois about the area or the wine, the grapes, or anything really at all, any kind of, any wine question, I am open. Or any, do any of these chateaus or vineyards, are they open for tastings? That's a good question for you guys. Do they receive visitors? Do you know uh, David or Kim Chen? Yes, uh, Vignoble uh, Bellefontaine. Uh, Yan, they, if we see in the, the magazine, they have beautiful uh, accommodation to to welcome uh, opinion members. And if you want to visit them, you just need to let them know. And oh, wow. Email member service, they will tell you uh the give you the contact info and you can email them and tag your opinion members and they will welcome you arms wide open oh yeah if you do mention you're from opinion they'll treat you very well 
Oh yeah. So that's amazing. And also being able to stay there is, is just wonderful. You can enjoy your tasting and then just toddle back to your room. Sounds amazing. And it really is a beautiful, just a beautiful part of the world. Uh, Nîmes, the, the major city in the Costel de Nîmes, uh, Appalachian is a stunning city to visit. It's, as I said, it's a Roman city with a beautiful uh, forum, Roman forum, a Colosseum in the middle, um, that really is the arenas of, of Nîmes are really worth visiting. The market in the middle of Nîmes, the traditional market is just amazing and makes, there's a counter in the middle where you can get incredible uh, meals and, you know, rustic market style meals. It's just great. Uh, cheese pairing. Uh, cheese pairing for the three least wine. I'm going to give it one more taste. This is a great question. I find the, um, the slightly more tannic element to this third wine would um, definitely, for me, be more interesting with hard cheese than a softer cheese. I tend to prefer soft cheeses with either white wines or with very smooth red wines. Um, and I think you wouldn't necessarily, it's not powerful enough necessarily for a very, very old crystallized. I would go more with a, a mature cheddar or um, Gruyere or Comté or something along those lines, but not a 10 year either, you know, nothing that's too, too powerful and sharp either. Uh, Radine has more of a general question. I noticed four to five years is noted as a short to midterm aging, what would be considered long-term aging. So I often, when I'm giving my notes, my short-term aging is sort of two to four years. Midterm would be sort of five to eight years. And long-term would be anything from eight to 15 years. You know, there's wines that can go for 20 years or more, but most wines today are made to be uh, appreciated, even long-term, ones that have long-term aging potential within 10 years, they tend to become approachable. So I would say that a good rule of thumb is sort of, yeah, two to four years is two to, yeah, two to three, two to four is short-term aging, four to, let's say, eight is mid midterm aging, and then eight plus, 10 plus would be long-term aging, in my view. Yeah, pleasure, pleasure. Uh, Jackie, so we, do have, we do have a question, Jackie, if a couple of questions ago. What what Blick score would you give to these three wines? Oh, that's a good question, Connie. So these are not wines that I tasted. Uh, I've tasted the more recent vintages, which are in the upcoming cellar, but I haven't tasted these ones. But I would find that, um, so Blick, for those who aren't uh, familiar, balance, length, in, uh, intensity, and complexity, uh, is what that stands for. And this is just a, a quick way of analyzing a wine and giving it a sort of a score and a rating. Um, I definitely found the uh, the balance on all three wines was high. Uh, the Chateau Saint-Benizet doesn't have the longest length. It's not the most complex of wines, but it has lovely balance. It's that softness, it's that approachability that gives it a lot of, of character here. Um, a lower score isn't necessarily a sign that the wine isn't as good. It's just, it might not be as complex, it might not be an age-worthy wine. So um, I would say, let's say the first wine would probably have my lowest score, not because it's lacking in balance, but I think it's a beautiful wine that's drinking well, just because it doesn't have quite as much intensity, complexity, or um, or what was the third intensity length as the others. I would give a very high score to the Belle Fontaine, just slightly more of that intensity on the mid palate. Uh, lovely balance, such freshness there. Uh, moderate complexity. Uh, and then I, I would probably give a very a, a similar score for different reasons to the Domaine des Trois uh, because you've got a little bit more structure there. Again, lovely balance for a different style, not quite as intense, but potentially similar levels of complexity, but it, a little bit more balance and structure. So I, I, I would say wines two and three, I can give you a, a number because again, that would prejudice the first wine, which I don't think is any lesser. I just think it is overall a softer, more early drinking, immediate sort of style of wine. Uh, I hope that was... A roundabout way to answer your question, but without giving a specific number so as not to prejudice one wine over the other. Were there any other questions coming in? Good 
Yes, I thought these, I, I think these are a great representation of the kind of styles coming out of the Southern Rhone Valley. We have two from the same vineyard, the Costiel de Nîmes, but again, we saw two quite different styles there. And then I think that the third wine is a great representation of a uh, cooler part of the Southern Rhone Valley, cooler because it's got a slight, uh, sitting on a slight promontory, so you get a little bit of altitude there. Um, and you get those little red fruit notes from that slightly cooler area and you're a little bit further north as well. Um, and slightly more structured, as I said, that Mistral wind, those um, uh, mainly clay and limestone soils there. Three different styles, three different expressions, but all very versatile wines that pair really easily with quite a wide number of dishes. If you're going to drink the wine on its own, I think that the first and second are the best for sipping on their own. Uh, and the third is more of a food wine. Uh, and if you were going to serve all three, I would definitely serve them personally in the order that we tasted them today. What fruit flavors did you find in the third wine? So I had notes of uh, plum, dark plum. I had some hints of uh, raspberry as well. I sort of found that there were red and black fruit elements. I almost had a, a very subtle nuttiness, but uh, not just a grilled or roasted nut, more like a marzipan type note. And then on the finish, I had uh, a little bit of spice, almost like a licorice sort of note on that wine. So those are the things that I was finding, but for the fruit, more sort of plum and raspberry for sure for me. But again, I find that wine is extremely personal in terms of what we smell, what we taste. We Each person is more sensitive to specific fruits uh, flowers, spices, you know, it, depending on what you grew up tasting and smelling and cooking, you're going to no, perceive certain aromatics and certain uh, flavoring components more than somebody else and pick up on them more. So nobody's right or wrong. You know, I often have people saying to me, I smell raspberries. Am I right about smelling raspberries? Of course you are. If you, if you smell raspberries, you smell raspberries. Uh, and uh, I definitely, for me, that was what I picked up on this one. And Jackie, yes. Since you 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 taste those from this year, what can you, besides their tasting note? Do you remember something you can share with us as a behind the scene that beyond? So yeah, that? definitely. If you pick up the wines, the uh, the Bellefontaine and the Troilis, uh from this year, I think it'd be really fun if you had any leftover of the older vintage to compare the two because. Obviously, with a vintage, an, uh, a year younger vintage is the 2020 instead of the, sorry, the 21 on the uh, Bellefontaine and the 20 on the Domaine des Trois Lys, uh, you're going to get just a sort of a, a tighter, slightly tighter, fresher wine. Uh, I found that on the uh, Bellefontaine, I had all that lovely dark fruit and those floral notes, but a little bit of red fruit there as well, a little tangier. Uh, slightly tighter on the body, but I think that with time will soften the way this wine is going. It'll go in a very similar direction. And the Domaine des Trois I had a slight earthiness on that wine uh, that was really nice uh, from the 2021 vintage, which is a little bit cooler. Uh, or 2020, is it? Sorry, 2020 for the Domaine des Trois um, but I found a little bit, a slight earthiness on that wine that was really attractive and sort of underscored the red and the dark fruit in a nice way. Yeah, it's 2021. Yes, that's what I thought it was, 2021. 2021, so they've, they've gone two vintages from the 19 to the 2021. You never know. Uh, they potentially had a smaller harvest in 2020. The 2021, so that was a slightly cooler vintage in the in the Rhone Valley. And so you get a, a brighter, fresher aspect to it. And that that slight earthiness, as I said, to underscore those that tangy red fruit and that darker fruit as well. So, so that's what I think you'll find with these uh, younger vintages is overall just fresher profile and slightly firmer and uh and, and this is great because you'll you're seeing tasting them now how they soften within a sort of a year's age so there you go if you look in the chat you'll see the uh, lot numbers and all the information for the two wines that are going to be in the that are in the current C303 seller. So if you like these wines definitely pick up the next vintage. I think that another thing that I love about Rhone wines 
beyond their easy drinking, crowd pleasing capacity and how versatile they are with food pairing is also that they're just great value. I honestly, I think from mo from if you look around the winemaking regions of France, uh, I, I find that the Rhone is often one of the areas that offers the best bang for your buck. Give Chad, you look like you have something to add. You got a look on your face. <laughs> no. Perfect. Okay. So I thanks. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, thank you Pleasure. to all our members for today for joining us. I hope it was enjoyable and informative. Great, great questions in the chat today. Yeah. Thanks for and joining in so much. Again, Jackie, thank you so much for taking time out of your day just to help us through this journey. My pleasure. My pleasure. I love it. Great wines. Kim, great oh, job again. Thank you, Paul, for watching my YouTube videos. That's <laughs> nice. I have. I need more time to make more. I'm making a series of videos coming up on the uh, Macon region in Burgundy, so I will keep you posted. Hey, Jackie, you want to plug the YouTube video? You want any where people can find you on on YouTube? Uh, if you if you just type in my name, I write Jackie with a Y, which trips people up a lot of the time. But Jackie Blisson, B L I S S O N. If you type Jackie Blisson into YouTube, I have a YouTube channel where I just give um, I explain uh, wine terms and uh, terminology and wine regions and everything. So if you want to learn a little bit more about wine in a simple, uh, hopefully approachable way. Uh, check it out definitely and it's the same for my Instagram and and uh, Facebook and all the rest I'm not as active on Facebook more Instagram and YouTube for sure and you also have wine travel videos yeah yeah I did uh, <laughs> I, I love the Jura wine region I made one Perfect. last year at the Jura yeah. and hopefully doing a couple more coming up excellent thank you so much Jackie for this yeah, afternoon my pleasure. Appreciate thanks to it. everybody for joining you, in everybody. enjoy your Saturday Enjoy. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.